Hello, class. Welcome back. We are talking about Queen Elizabeth I now, and in particular, the reading of hers that we do is Speech to the Troops at Tilbury. Now, or it's probably pronounced Tilbury, right, if I were to do an English pronunciation, although remember we learned that the uh, old modern English pronunciation is actually quite similar to our American or modern American English pronunciation. So who knows? Maybe when I said Tilbury, that is closer to how they said it back then, as opposed to what they would say nowadays, which would be Tilbury. Anyway, I'm going to show you a picture of Elizabeth I here. We have an artist rendering. There she is. She's holding. Oh, she disappeared. Hold on. Sorry. I made it too big. There we go. She's got a crown on the royal, you know, crown jewels in the crown and her scepter. And then that little ball thing. I forget what they call that, but it's part of the crown jewel. And the and the king's all hold that. I mean, I should look that up and see what that is, because I am curious. And because you always see that in all the crown jewel collections. They've got the crown, the scepter, and the and the little ball thing that they clutch in a hand. So maybe maybe that's what they throw at parliament members who fall asleep <laughs> to wake them up. That's a joke, just a joke, guys. All right. Coming back to you all. I'm gonna turn off the uh full screen here and come back to me there we go all right so um yes queen elizabeth the first as i said earlier she is king henry the eighth's daughter by his second wife anne boleyn of course interestingly anne boleyn was the wife she beheaded because she could not have male children or she didn't at least have any male who knows if she couldn't but uh, you know the big the big speculation is that Henry VIII was the one with the fertility problems because he had them repeatedly, wife after wife after wife after wife after wife after wife. Yes, there were six wives. And he ended up beheading two of them. Um, I mean, he has some trumped up charges why he beheaded them. But, you know, ultimately, they were, the, they were two women who did not produce a male heir. All right. And he divorced Catherine of Aragon, his first wife, when she wouldn't. When she didn't produce a male heir, she just had a daughter. And then Anne Boleyn had another daughter. So he beheaded her. The third one, Jane Seymour, actually produced a male heir. And he stayed married to her the whole time until she died of natural causes. Then after, after um, Jane, and, and that male heir was Edward VI, who went on to become king of England after Henry VIII died. So then after Jane Seymour, um, he was married to, let's see, I have to do the little rhyme. There's a rhyme that you can remember for the order of what happened to each of the wives of Henry VI. So it's, it's married, beheaded, died. So Mary, or no, divorced, beheaded, died. Because he divorced Catherine of Aragon, beheaded uh, Anne Boleyn. Jane Seymour died of natural causes. So it goes divorced, beheaded, died, then divorced, beheaded, survived. So the next wife, he divorced again after after Jane Seymour. He granted himself a divorce from her because he's the head of the church then. So he doesn't need to go to the Pope anymore. It's one of the reasons he made himself the head of his own new church because he was tired of answering to the Pope, wanted to consolidate power into his own hands, the hands of England itself, and not be ruled by Rome and the Pope. Um, so that's why he made the Church of England, the Anglican Church. Uh, and then, um, let's say, oh, yeah, who is the wife after Jane Seymour? That was Catherine. Was it Anne? Anne? Uh, was it Anne of Cleves next? No, no, no. Anne of Cleves was beheaded. So the next one was Catherine. Catherine's. I'm going to look this up really fast because I don't want to give you the wrong information. Hold on. One minute. Uh, sorry. Just one moment. I'm going to get this information for you. Ah, yes, that's right. It is right. Catherine Howard came next. Um, yes. So Catherine Howard was after Elizabeth the, or after Jane Seymour. Jane Seymour died of natural causes after producing a male heir. And then we had, he was married to Catherine Howard and he divorced her, granted himself a divorce. And then, um, and, and she didn't produce an heir. 
at all. And then after Catherine Howard, he married Anne of Cleves. Anne of Cleves didn't produce a male heir, so or any heirs, no no children. So then, um, or maybe there, sometimes there are like these women have children, but they like die in the womb or um, are stillborn, that kind of thing. Um, so then Anne of Cleves, no surviving children, he beheaded her. Um, in, always in quest of those male heirs. Then he was married to Catherine Parr. That was his last wife, and and that was the one. Remember that the the um the and the Protestant leaders of England that thought that Anne Askew was too far out in her Protestant beliefs. He want they wanted to they thought that Catherine Parr was a friend of Anne Askew's and a co-conspirator in trying to talk Henry the Eighth into more quote unquote radical religious beliefs, but the, what the beliefs were was she was reading the Bible herself and so gaining knowledge from reading the Bible herself and having her own interpretations of the things that she read, found in the Bible. Uh, and so Catherine Parr um, was supposedly part of this circle as well. And so these, um, these government leaders who did not want um, her to, or want her to turn Henry VIII away from um, what they believed in, you know, so so that they could share power with him because he, they would be on the same belief, you know, plane. Um, they wanted Anne Askew to uh, basically squeal on Catherine Parr and turn her in so that they could get rid of her. Uh, but as we know, Anne Askew withstood all the torture that even broke her legs so much that she had to be carried for, um, to where she was burned at the stake. So she never did turn in Catherine Parr. And Catherine Parr reconciled with Henry VIII because for a little bit, you know, they were saying, oh, she's doing these things. She's opposing you and, and you're getting into fights over religious beliefs. So she re she was able to reconcile with him. And then he died not too long after. So she ended up surviving him, you know. I'll tell you, I don't know why any of Henry's wives married him after a couple of them had terrible demises because... You know, what goes around comes around. If he's marrying you because he killed the last one, why would you want to be his wife? I don't know, you know. Or maybe they're too scared not to be his wife. I don't know. Maybe maybe, maybe they're worried about retaliation against their families if, if they didn't marry him. Who knows, you know. But just a very, very bizarre situation, you know, for us nowadays. You know, we, we just, it seems so, so, uh, just alien to what we know, you know, that you would actually have a wife beheaded, you know, so that you could get out of being married to her. I mean, of course, things like that happen, crimes of passion, right? But anyway, this was the head of the country, the king doing this, you know, so ay ay ay. If imagine if our president did that. Yeah. Or or if modern day king of England would do that. Or we don't have a king of England. We have a queen of England now, Queen Elizabeth II. So anyway, Elizabeth I, interestingly, her mother was beheaded by Henry VIII because she produced a daughter, not a son. And then he trumped up charges saying, oh, she's having an affair or something or other or whatever, you know, uh, something that he could, you know, say, all right, she's guilty and um, therefore she needs to die. So uh, the funny thing is, is Elizabeth I went on to become the strongest monarch England has ever had. And she probably accomplished the most. She had incredible exploration happen while she was queen. She defeated the Spanish Armada. She expanded the British Empire. She enriched the British Empire. She had Shakespeare, you know, who produced his works. <laughs> you know, she was uh, the Lord Chamberlain's men were paid, you know, they were the ma um, the Lord Chamberlain who, who worked for Queen Elizabeth I um, was a patron of Shakespeare's uh, play company. And um, it would have been, they would have been called the king's men because when there's a king, the the king supports a, you know a playwright and that company is called the king's men. But because Elizabeth was a queen and women were not allowed to be on stage, I think they thought it would be a little unseemly for it to be the queen's men. So instead, they said, "All right, the Lord Chamberlain, who is one of your chief servants, he will then sponsor this." this company of actors and playwrights that Shakespeare was ahead of. And so they called them the Lord Chamberlain's men. Um, and then as soon as Queen Elizabeth died, then the king supported them again. So there you go. Um, anyway, 
Queen Elizabeth, extremely successful ruler. She lived from 1533 to 1603. Um, of course, she's is the squarely in the Renaissance time period, and she lived to the age of 70, so very healthy for the time period. Of course, she's getting all the best care, you know, best night nutrition and medical care that's available because she's the Queen of England, right? Um, of course, what they know about medical and healthcare is nowhere near what we know nowadays. So, like, they were still, like, doing crazy things like bloodletting and, and things like that where they think, oh, you're you're sick because you have too much of one humor or another humor. So we got to let that humor out of your blood. And of course, you're just driving people's iron counts down and um, <laughs> making them very sick by doing that. Okay. So anyway, she ascended the throne of England and also became the head of the Church of England in 1558. Because remember, as the monarch of England, she's the head of the Church of England as well, because that's what Henry established when he established the uh, Anglican Church. Elizabeth deftly walked the tightrope between females and males, uh, Protestants and Catholics, and war and peace, England and Spain, art and politics, virginity and community. So she had all of these opposites and she straddled them very, very nicely and was able to achieve this incredible balance um, because the Church of England was still very, very new. And so it definitely had its opposition in former in people who were Catholic and who still supported the Catholic Church. In fact, ha Henry VIII, you know, church, he headed the Church of England. He, he, he um, started it and headed it. And then his son, who took over after he died, Edward VI, continued on. But then after Edward VI died, because Edward VI was kind of sickly. He had set in the throne when he was about 15 years old. It didn't last very long. He was kind of sickly. Again, they attribute it maybe to like the gene pool of, of Henry VIII because he wasn't able to have very many like healthy offspring. Uh, a lot of them were stillborn or died in the womb or, you know, died uh, or, or, or the woman wasn't even able to conceive at all. So anyway, he died. And then after he died, England had its very first queen. It was it was actually Mary the First, who is the daughter of Henry the Eighth and his first wife, Mary or Catherine of Aragon. Um, and so Mary the First, she had been raised, or her mother had been raised in Spain, and so she was very Catholic. And uh, so they never gave up the Catholic Church. And Mary the First, when she became queen, she said, "Nope, that's it. England is returning to Catholicism. Enough of this Church of England. We're going back to the true Church, the Catholic Church." And so then anybody who was Protestant or, or Anglican Church of England was on the outs and they couldn't have governmental positions and all the Catholics could. And uh, she was also nicknamed Bloody Mary because she would um, torture people and, uh, you know, kill people uh, that that um, did not support her causes. OK, and then after she died, Elizabeth I became queen and Elizabeth I actually was uh, she supported the Church of England. So she returned the whole country to the Church of England and said, okay, nope, now the Catholics are on the outs and the Church of England or Anglican church members are the ones who hold all the governmental positions um, and are the ones that are on the up and up with uh, society and the law. Uh, but also, interestingly, she was the second female monarch. So there you still have this incredible male tradition of being the head of the country, right? And having that power invested in, with the male figure. So, you know, there are a lot of people who are like, oh, there's a female on the throne again. I don't know how I feel about this. You know, even though she is at the head of the great chain of being and she's like God's intended, right? But I don't know, is she God's intended? She doesn't support, you know, the Catholic church. She's back, we're back to the church of England or she's a female, not a male. Um, her mother was Anne Boleyn, who was beheaded, and therefore, you know, we've got this bad influence, right? Because she must have been bad because she was beheaded, right? So some people even called her illegitimate because they considered that marriage illegitimate because Henry VIII ended it in murder. Um, well, it was legitimized murder by him. So I guess what do we, we don't call that murder, right? If it's legitimized, I guess that's legal killing them. All right. So anyway, um, a lot of people opposed her then because of that. So she had to very delicately balance all these factions in England, and she did it quite well. And she even had to balance herself against Spain, a very important enemy. Not only an important enemy, but that was like, you know, her, what do you call it, her half-mother, 
Mary's mother, Catherine of Aragon, she was from Spain. And the whole reason Henry VIII married her was to try to broker better relations between those countries. But it erupted in an all-out war because England and Spain were vying for the same colonies in the New World. They were fighting over who got what, who got the most treasure, and they had pirates attacking each other's ships.